Happy Sabbath. Thank you for that reading, Lisa. It's great to um, focus on a portion of the Word before we get into a study of the Word. And what we're going to talk about today is the covenants. Now, it's only partially coincidental that the Sabbath school lesson is on the topic at the moment. It's actually a topic I've been considering for a long time and the implications of the two covenants. And then the Sabbath school lesson came along on the topic as well, which I guess prompted that little bit extra study into the topic. But, um, and I've really been enjoying the study of the covenants. It's going into a lot of detail and lots of little points, but what I aim to do today is let's take this topic, break it down, simplify it, and then get our head around it. See, as, as Seventh-day Adventists, we often look at the topic of the covenants, especially in regard to God's law, was it done away with or not? And that's normally the particular point that we study when we're studying with other people, was the law done away with with the old covenant? We're going to touch on that, but that's not going to be the focus, because the two covenants themselves are a powerful lesson. Let's get that out of it, rather than focusing on particular issues that we may have that we need to study. And they need to be studied when we're on that topic. But today, let's look at the big picture of the covenants. What is God's will for me? What has been his will in the past? And so we're going to, first of all, look at what is a covenant. Obviously, that's important. We need a groundwork to work from. And then we are going to start to dig in, how does God work with covenants? Is there only two covenants? And, and where are we at today? I just want to have a word of prayer as we begin. And as, um, as was mentioned before, just in the last day or two, a bit of a cold has snuck up on me. But um, God can overpower those things. And um, let's just focus on his words. Let's have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for um, the experience that we can have with you through that. And I pray that as we study now that you'll be with us, you'll be with me in a, a special way that your word may be shared. And may it be clear to many. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so the first question, the question we need to ask first is, is what is a covenant? Um, and if I asked you all, we'd probably get a fairly similar answer. And so the definition that I'm putting here is a covenant is an agreement between two or more parties based on mutual promises. Now, a covenant is an agreement it's something where different parties agree on a, on a certain point, and it can, doesn't just have to be between two, it can be between many, and there are promises involved. Now, not necessarily every party of the covenant needs to have a promise. Sometimes promises can be just by one or a couple of the parties, and that you'll see that as we look through this topic a little bit more. And so what I want to do is outline the basics of a covenant. First of all, we have the parties, then we have the promises, what are the deal? And I've left a couple of spots blank here because as we go, we'll use this template and we'll be laying different details of different covenants on this template. And then there's always a principle or a law that the covenant is based on. What is the reason, what's the deal here? And then how is that principle or law recorded? What is the sign of the covenant to acknowledge that there is a covenant being made? How is it sealed, and what happens if it's broken? So that's going to be the outline that we're going to be looking at today as we look through this topic, because all through the centuries, God has used covenants with his people. Now, the very first covenant was made before there were even people. And it's actually the most important covenant, and it's one that still stands to this very day, and that was a covenant between the Father and the Son that decided if there was ever sin we would need a solution to that problem. And Jesus covenanted himself to be that solution. That's before you sinned. It was already considered at that time. And this is a, a very interesting covenant that was made between the Father and the Son, and it's a very encouraging one for us, because even though we find ourselves in a terrible situation in this world, God already foresaw that that could happen, and he already had a solution for that. And I really love this quote. So great was his, that's God's love for the world, that he covenanted to give his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And this last sentence, as soon as there was sin, there was a savior. So there was never a time the savior was already ready. As soon as sin existed, there would be a savior. Praise God for his foresight. And so... 
we're going to look at the first human covenant or the covenant God made with man and that's in Genesis chapter 3. I hope you've got your Bibles with you because it's going to be a Bible study. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, a fairly well-known text. <clears throat> now this in, in some ways it's not a fresh covenant, it's actually the covenant we've been talking about, the everlasting covenant where God has expressed that to his people. Genesis chapter 3 and we're looking at verse 15. And it says there, and I, that's God speaking to um, Adam and Eve and the serpent at this time. He says, I will put enmity between thee, the serpent, and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, uh, we've discussed this um, before in another sermon I shared, that God gave enmity. Interesting gift he gave. But this is a promise that he made. He covenanted with the people, I'm going to give you enmity. Now, if I said that I have enmity towards you, you wouldn't think that was a positive thing. But God gave the gift of enmity, hatred, for sin. Now, we love sin, but we also, we have an interesting situation, and Romans plays this out very clearly, that we fight with ourselves. The things I don't want to do, I do, and so on. So this concept that God says, listen, you've sinned. The situation's not good, but I straight away am stepping in. And of course, the most exciting part is further in the verse, it says, between thy seed and her seed. The seed of the woman, of course, was Christ, came, and the promise that is in there as well. Then we come along further, and we have Abraham's covenant. Genesis 17. Come to Genesis 17. In Genesis 17, we've got God is speaking with Abram. And at this time, he's 90 years old, or 99 years old, and we, we go through the story here. And I want to jump in at verse 7. God speaking to Abram, he says, And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant. And this is God's part of the deal here. I will be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee, and I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every child among you shall be circumcised. Now we've got a few elements in there of the, the covenants we were looking at. But God is saying, I'm going to choose you as my people. Now, this covenant is not to be confused with what we refer to as the first covenant. We're going to jump into Well, let's jump into that right now. We'll come back to the Abraham's covenant later on. Let's look at Israel's covenant. Across now, we've got the Abraham's descendants. They've gone into Egypt. They've come out of Egypt, and they are at Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 19. Exodus 19, verse 1, it says, In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they unto the wilderness of Sinai. This is the setting. They're here in, in the wilderness. They're at Sinai, at the base of the mountain. Now, God comes at this point. He's taken them out of Egypt. He's chosen them as a special people. And he says, I'm going to make a covenant with you. Let's jump to verse 5. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. So God is saying here, I'm going to choose you as a special people. It's a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This is what God's deal is with Israel. And it's interesting if you jump back into those previous verses, God is saying, listen, I've already been with you. I've taken you out of the land of Egypt, and now I'm going to make a deal with you. He's already shown that he can keep his part of the deal. He's already led them out of Egypt. We see miracle after miracle to this point. God says, I've shown that I can do this. Now, do you want to make a deal? The deal is you're going to be my special people. I just want you to obey my commands. Everything in this first covenant, this is what we refer to normally as the first covenant, the covenant with Israel is a parallel, <coughs> sorry, that you will find that you can have with God yourself. Now, we go through this chapter, 
and we see that the covenant is established in here. Now, verse, uh, chapter 20 of Exodus, what's that well known for? What's in Exodus chapter 20? It's the commandments, right? Okay, so now we've got a law brought in just after a covenant deal has been made. Now, we might say it's coincidental. God was talking about the covenant in chapter 19 and 20. He just decided to get on to the commandments. No, I challenge you, just read through that chapter, start into the next chapter, and this flows on. Basically, what happens here is God says, you'll be my chosen people if you're obedient. And the people say, everything that God has said, we'll do and be obedient. God says, okay, here's the law. And he lays out the law in chapter 20. And then we go through the next chapters. And, well, let's read verse 8 of 19 which is the people's part. And all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people to the Lord. And then as we go through the rest of the, there's a bit of dialogue. Then Moses is called up to the mountain. The 10 commandments are given. And then in the next chapters, chapter 22, 21, 22, and 23, are various different laws and ordinance are given. These are extra parts of this covenant, extra things that God is requiring of the people, and a lot of terms and conditions, you could basically say, are in this little portion here. But the thing to note is the law, the Ten Commandments, was not the deal. That wasn't the covenant. The covenant was based on that law. Okay, so we've got a deal between God, you'll be my people, and the people say, everything that God says we will do. That's the deal. That's the covenant. Now, what is it that God wants them to do? The law. The law is the foundation for the covenant. Remember to keep these two separate here. And then we notice all of these other things. Now, come with me to chapter 23, after God has given a lot of instruction, and we're going to look at verse 32. This reminds me of something like an insurance policy when you read this fine print. Verse 32 of chapter 23, Thou shalt make no covenant with them nor with their gods. Talking about the other, the heathen nations. God says, I'm making a covenant with you, no other covenants, between me only. Remember, he says, I'm a jealous God. I want you, you're special to me. Terms and conditions, no other covenants with any other um, pagan entities. And so we see through here that the covenant has been established. In verse 24, Moses goes up into the mountain, and we see that um, in verse 4, And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. So now we've got the um, leaders or someone representing each of the 12 tribes also being here to ratify this covenant and make it um, a part of it. Verse 7, we see that the covenant is confirmed. And then in verse 8, let's read verse 8. And Moses took the blood... And sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you concerning all these words. Now, blood was shed to ratify this covenant. Interesting point to remember. And then in chapter 24, and we're going to jump to verse 12, and the Lord said to Moses, Come up into the mountain and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone and a law and commandments which I have written that thou mayest teach them. God says, I'm going to put it in stone. I'm going to give it to you. Here is the law that this whole covenant is based on. So what we need to see is the importance of law, the moral law, the Ten Commandments shows what is sin. If the, if the people are to avoid sin and obey God, they need to know the basis. Of course, that is what the commandments were. And then, as we saw, there was a whole ceremonial laws that were given. They were how to deal with sin. I really appreciated a couple of weeks ago, Pastor, Pastor Murray said, we have the two commandments, the two laws. One law is what is sin, the other one is how to deal with sin. One shows us the problem, the other one shows the example. The sacrificial system, the lamb that was slain was an example of how we overcome the sin, which is identified by the Ten Commandment law. Let's have an ex example here of covenants. Now, this is a marriage covenant. The parties are a husband and a wife, and there's promises. And depending on your vows, they may be different, but the husband says, I will love and cherish you, and the wife says, I will honor and respect you. Both of them, they make promises as part of this covenant. And the principle that, or the law that this is based on is loyalty to each other alone. Now, this came up in our Sabbath school. 
when we covenant in a marriage relationship, it is based on law, a principle, and that principle is in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not commit adultery. Okay, that is the law that a marriage is based on. And that's recorded in our vows. The sign of that is we have a wedding ceremony. So we make it public to everybody that I am choosing this woman to be my wife. That's our public announcement. And it's sealed, you may now kiss the bride. That is the, the sealing of that part. You are now married. And if it's broken, there can be forgiveness or there's freedom. A marriage, we always say, till what do us part? Death is the termination of that covenant. That's the deal. When you're no longer, one party is no longer alive, the deal is that's the end of the covenant. It's no longer in existence. Um, and also, of course, the Bible has a few terms and conditions on this as well, where it talks about adultery and so on. But these, uh, this is just an example of how a covenant can lay out in everyday life that we see ourselves. But notice... Interesting, in a situation here where, say, if the, it is broken because of death, the covenant no longer applies, then you choose to remarry. What law would the next marriage be based on? It's going to be exactly the same law, isn't it? Now, think about that when we're looking at covenants with God. God made a covenant with Israel based on the law, the Ten Commandments. That covenant ended, we'll look at that soon, then God established a new covenant based on exactly the same law. Let's not do away with the law just because we're doing away with the covenant. The law still stands. An interesting point to remember. So we've been looking at the first covenant, the covenant with Israel. Let's put this on the same template here. The parties are God and the nation of Israel. God says, you will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation to me. And Israel's promise was everything that God has said, we will do. Now, the principle, what was it? What was, um, what was God's will? It was laid out in the Ten Commandments and various other ordinances. How was it recorded? Tables of stone. God says, I'm going to give them to you in stone. Now, the sign of this, that you were part of this nation of Israel, was circumcision. Now, it seems a little detached, but that was what God said. That's how I want to identify my people, is through the act of circumcision. And this covenant was sealed by the blood of bulls and goats. We saw that the bulls and goats were killed and that blood was sprinkled to show that by death this covenant has been made. And if it is broken, if this covenant of all that God has said we will do, in other words, if there was sin, the sacrificial system was the example of atonement for sin, that there would be life shed and therefore there could be salvation from that. But remember, if a party died or, the, or it was broken, that covenant could cease to exist. But I tell you what, God is very merciful. The first day in, he could have said, no, you've broken the covenant, it's all off. But God says, no, I've chosen you regardless. You will be my special people. Let's um, continue to move on a little. I think a key thing we need to remember is even in this covenant, people were saved by grace. There was never a time that we see here, it wasn't that if they could be good enough, they would be saved. The, the deal was that they, were, they promised to be obedient, but it's only through grace that they could be obedient. Now, this covenant did fail. Well, God didn't. God kept his part of the deal. He said, I'll bless you, I'll be there for you, you'll be my chosen people. But the people failed, the nation failed. They didn't keep his laws, and they abused the sacrificial system. The actual, the, the solution to the breaking it, they used and abused that as well. And then as we get through history, we see that God would send prophets to draw them back to the covenant. He'd send them punishments in various times to draw them back to him. And of course, one of the key ones is they were taken captivity into Babylon. And Daniel, a key player in Babylon's time, He's praying to God and saying, God, how much longer? What's, what's happening here? And let's just jump in there. Daniel chapter 9. Going Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. And then just before the minor prophets. Daniel chapter 9 starts off with Daniel praying. 
And a lot of that's over his confusion of Daniel 8. He's trying to figure this out. It says in verse 3, And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes, and I prayed unto the Lord. And then we've got his prayer recorded here, confessing sins and saying, yeah, we've broken this covenant. We haven't kept our part of this deal. But come on down further to verse 19. He's finishing off his prayer saying, O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do defer not for thy own sake. In other words, those that you have chosen. O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. Does this look good? God's chosen a special people. They're going to be his. They're going to represent him. And here they are in captivity in a pagan nation, it's not looking too good for God to have his chosen people like this. How powerful is he as a God? And Daniel's saying, how long is this time going to be? And there's, um, let's look at verse 24, a well-known verse that we look at. We see an angel comes, Gabriel comes, verse 21, comes down and speaks with Daniel, says in verse 23, at the beginning of your prayer, I was told to come and speak with you. And listen what he says in verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression, in other words, stop breaking the covenant, to make an end of sins, make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Now, a huge study in that alone, which we're not going to dig into. But all of a sudden, a time's been given. Seventy weeks is determined. This is the portion, the cut off from a longer prophecy that is to your people, and here's what you need to do. Of course, study, uh, students of prophecy, there's, there's so much that can come into there, but God gave them 70 weeks. Keep that in mind, and I want you to look at just something very interesting, Matthew 18. What's Matthew 18 known for? Whenever we say we need to use Matthew 18, it's normally because there's a problem. Matthew 18 is known as the chapter of resolution, how, to, how you, we should treat offending brothers. And I just want to jump into verse 21 and 22. Jesus has been speaking, and then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? till seven times. Now, it was apparently there was a bit of a thing that, you know, seven times a perfect number, you forgive seven times. But I like Jesus' answer. He says, Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but seventy times seven. Think back to Daniel. Seventy weeks. How many days in a week? Seventy times seven. God is saying, listen, I'm giving you seventy times seven. And a really interesting parallel with the gospel there. I'm going to give you seventy times seven days. But what did God say? Let's make them years. See, God is merciful. He gives more. He gives more. But he says there will be a time when this covenant will have to end because this covenant is being continually broken. So we see the 490 days or years, the 70 times 7, and God could have terminated the covenant early at any time he chose because the deal had been broken. He could have accused Israel. In fact, we read in Hebrews chapter 8. In fact, come over to Hebrews because we're going to be spending most of the rest of the time in, in the New Testament now. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 8 and 9. Really interesting, Hebrews 8, 9, 10, and 11 on this whole New Testament covenant. But we're jumping in straight to Hebrews 8 and verses 8 and 9. For finding fault with them, that's the, the nation of Israel, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. No, not the old covenant, not the covenant that we had um, when they came out of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. The blame is fair and square 
on the nation of Israel for not keeping their part of the deal. But do you know what God did? He turned around and says, I am going to send my son. He is going to die. Now, what's the other way to get out of a covenant? It's broken or one of the parties dies. God, in this situation, he says, my son will die. I'll take the blame that you have sinned. I'll take that blame to end the covenant. Now, you think about that. He could have easily pointed the finger, and we see here in Hebrews, he's admitting, yeah, they broke the covenant, but I will die for the covenant. I'll take that blame to finish this covenant. Interesting concept there. But, of course, even with that covenant ended, the law that it was based on still remains. And, of course, we know that the sanctuary service pointed to the sacrifice that Christ would make. And the lamb representing the death of that Christ paid for sin, and the priest representing the mediator between the two people in the covenant, between God and man. They were the parties of the covenant, and the priest represented that. Now, there's an interesting quote here that I want us to look at. Through this covenant, uh, though this covenant was made with Adam and renewed by Abraham, what we're actually looking at now is we're going back to the Abrahamic covenant here. It was not, it was not the first covenant, even though it's talking about Abraham and Adam. This was the covenant. Alan White makes it quite clear: the covenant, the new covenant, was actually based on the pre-Israel covenant. And it says here, though this covenant, the new covenant, was made with Adam and renewed to Abraham, it could not be ratified until the death of Christ. It had existed by the promise of God since the first intimation of redemption had been given. It had been accepted by faith, yet when ratified by Christ, it is called a new covenant. The law of God was the basis of this covenant. What was it? The law of God, the same law, was still the basis of this covenant, which was simply an arrangement for bringing men again into harmony with the divine will, placing them where they could obey God's law. I just see so many times we see that God is, is working with us, not against us. He is a loving God. And come with me to Galatians 3, because God still uses the analogy of the old covenant with Israel, but now he refers to spiritual Israel. Galatians chapter 3, and we're going in at verse 6. Galatians 3, verse 6. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Jump down to verse 14 that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And then come down to verse 29. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, of course, the Jewish nation was very big on their lineage. I am Abraham's descendant. I am of the nation of Israel. Therefore, I am a child of the covenant. But what it's saying in it here is if you are Christ, then you are spiritually Abraham's seed. Now, most of us probably struggle to take our lineage back very far at all. Some people dig into this and they can go back to someone rich and famous or someone they don't want to be associated with. But regardless, to the Israelites, it was very important. But I, I can almost guarantee that none of us here can track our lineage back to Abraham. And that is not important when we see can we track our lineage to Christ? Not through a bloodline, but through a relationship with him. This is becoming the condition of the new covenant, not God choosing the nation of Israel, and therefore I am part of that nation. No, Christ is choosing you as an individual. And this new covenant is no longer with a nation, it's with you. If you think about that, God has chosen each one of us and said, hey, I've chosen you as my people, and let's strike up a covenant together. The principle still remains 
the application now is different. Let's, what we need to do is we need to take the old covenant, we need to look at all these elements from the old covenant, what is the spiritual parallel now that I can find? Come back to Hebrews. We're going to Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, verses 16 and 17. And God is here laying out, this is the new covenant, this is the deal. Hebrews 10, 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws where? In their hearts and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. The new covenant, God and individuals. The promises are, God says, I will be your God and you will be my people. And as individuals, the deal is we are to enter into this covenant. And we've got the choice. We can be part of it or not. But God doesn't say, if you obey, you'll be one of them. But entering in, he says, enter into this covenant. And to do that, we need to firstly accept the covenant and still obey. Obedience is still there because the law is still there, right? But... The difference is God isn't giving us the tables of stone. He's going to write it in our hearts. And that is an incredible advantage when God changes the heart. Because if the heart's not changed, all we are is a bunch of people trying to do good stuff, just like Israel time and time again failing. God wants to change us. The principle, the law is still the Ten Commandments, but it's written in our hearts, and the sign is baptism. When we are baptized, that is our public sign that I'm entering into this covenant with God, sealed by the blood of Christ. And it's interesting, the termination is no more sacrifice for sin. Now, that's why it sounds scary. What? What happens if I sin? What, what this means is, this is actually, I've taken this straight from Scripture, there's no more sacrifice for sin and that the sacrificial system has ended. Christ was that one sacrifice that there didn't have to be a continual sacrifice anymore. There's still forgiveness. God still forgives if we sin. So the spiritual covenant with spiritual Israel, God's people is no longer the nation of Israel. Now there's a, a big movement. We're going to go back to Israel. We've got to go back to the Holy Land. The temple's got to be rebuilt. That's gone. We need to move on from that point. It's no longer a nation. It's no longer anything like that, that God has chosen a special people by blood, by connection, by membership, by anything like that, God is now wanting to work with you as an individual. There's no sanctuary, but we can still learn from the sanctuary system. There's no longer a priesthood, but we can still learn from that priesthood. What is the spiritual parallel for that? And the criteria was birth, but the criteria now is our qualifications in Christ, which we'll look at in a little bit. Let's go to, where are we here? Galatians 3. We were in Galatians before, but I just want us to jump back to Galatians 3, 26 to 29. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26. For ye are all the children of God and faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ... There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We are told that under the new covenant, the conditions by which eternal life may be gained are the same as under the old perfect obedience. In the new and better covenant, Christ has fulfilled the law for the transgressors of law if they receive him by faith as a personal saviour. It is in the better covenant we are cleansed from sin by the blood of Christ. And then it says, all can now approach God through the merits of Christ. It is because the veil has been rent that men can draw nigh to God. They need not depend on priest or ceremonial sacrifice. Liberty is given to all to go directly to God through a personal saviour. God is interested in you as a person. But you see, human beings have a, a tendency, and I'm sure it's inspired by the devil, to get things mixed up. Now, the devil doesn't care which side you get mixed up on as long as you do. 
And we see this with the covenants, and there's two particular faults. And I've marked this, don't mix the covenants, because what happens is we do away with too much. We do away with the law. We throw the law out, no, the law is gone as well. We throw out the sanctuary message. Nearly every church has done away with the sanctuary message. I praise God that we still look at the sanctuary. We don't go sacrificing lambs, but there's a power of the whole gospel in the sanctuary. That as we study that, that's how we got to our understanding of end time events, was not doing away with the sanctuary entirely. And some go as far as doing over the whole Old Testament. That's all gone. No, that is all valuable still for us, for our salvation. And especially as they do away with the law, that totally changes things. It makes the covenant, um, the new covenant, almost worthless. It says, if it were not possible for human beings under the Abrahamic covenant, remember that's the new covenant, to keep the commandments of God, every soul of us is lost. The Abrahamic covenant is the covenant of grace. By grace are ye saved. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as receive him, to them gave he what? He gave them power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Sons of God. Disobedient children? No. Obedient to all his commandments. If it were not possible for us to be commandment keepers, then why does he make the obedience to his commandments the proof that we love him? Let that sink in. I, I was amazed when I came across this. What's, what's the Bible verse that jumps to mind on this topic? John 14, 15. If you love me? Now, why would God say, if you love me, keep my commandments, but we can't keep the commandments? It would be like me saying to my son, jump in the car and drive over here if you really love me. It's impossible. He can't do that. God doesn't give us something impossible to show that we love him. Imagine trying to show God you can love him, but you can never do what he's asked. Really interesting concept as I read that quote. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. The other fault that we have is we keep too much of the old covenant. So, of course, we, the old covenant was done away with, and we can do away with too many things. The flip side is we can keep too much of the old covenant in our, in our lives and in our religion. Some choose to keep the feasts. Now, of course, the feasts pointed towards things. The feasts were done away with as part of the old covenant. But we can tend to keep that. We can, some religions keep the priesthood. You're still answerable to a priest who mediates between you and the Father. And then we also tend to have a mentality of still a corporate, very corporate national type mentality, whether it's still looking at Israel being reestablished, or even as a church, we can say, no, it's us. The corporateness is very important to us. Let's not go too focused on the importance of the corporateness. And I want to look at a couple of quotes on this point as well. There are men professing to serve God who act the part of the priests and Levite. Our churches need a reconversion. The Holy Spirit of God must come into our hearts. We must submit to its molding and fashioning, or we shall lose our title to the immortal inheritance. In his sight, the souls of men are of equal value, without distinction of age or rank, of nationality or religious privilege. All are invited to come unto him and live. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. One thing we say, well, what about church? <laughs> Do we do away with church? There's a verse that normally jumps to mind when we talk on this topic, you know, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Any idea where that is in Scripture? Right here in Hebrews chapter 10. Let's read it. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. Now, do you remember just before where you read up to verse 23? Let's look at God still has a a value for church and for organization here. Hebrews 10, 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, what is the value of church for us today? It's not about having the membership. It's not about getting lots and lots of people in here to be part of the inheritance that's old covenant. Let's not pull that into this. The purpose here, the value that we see, is the assembling of ourselves together so that we can what? Exhort one another. That's our purpose as a church. Exhort one another because the connection is with Christ. 
let's be together, let's form this fellowship together. And hey, we need organization, we need to work together, we need a, a function to do that. But let's have that goal to exhort one another to Christ. So as we finish off, I just want to say, well, what does this all mean for me? We need to make this just a little personal before we, before we finish. And you know, God wants you to be one of his covenant people. Not based on birth, not based on membership, not based on who you are, who you were, but on who you can be, the qualifications that he wants to see. And these are well known in, in the book of Revelation 14 verse 12. Revelation 14.12 is a well-known text to, to us. We've just been looking in the previous verses in Revelation 14 of the three angels' messages, and it finishes off in verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that, what? Keep the commandments of God and have the, the two qualifications that you can be one of God's chosen people, that you can receive the inheritance. And this brings us to the very heart of what the whole new covenant is about, the whole concept. And that is that obedience is possible by the writing of God's law in your heart. Again, we're discussing this in the Sabbath. When the heart changes, everything else changes. Your whole approach to things changes. As we were talking about cookie, you throw some love into the mix and it changes everything. By partaking of the divine nature, the weakest human being begins to live the very life of Christ because it is in our heart. Because of Jesus' sinless life in the flesh, the requirement of the law can be fulfilled in us. He overcame sin in the same kind of body we have so that we could have his victory. What a blessing that he offers to us. This is the new covenant promise for every believing child. Let's just look at a few of these promises. It's the only way that we can meet the requirements of God's law. And it looks like, there we are. Christ in you, the hope of glory. What an incredible promise that we have there. We also see here, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What a promise that is given there. We also want to look here that because the carnal mind is not subject to the law of God, neither can be, we need to change. And, you know, we have the promises that that is exactly the thing that can happen. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Why are they not grievous? Because our heart has changed, our desires have changed. That's what God wants to do with us in this new covenant relationship. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Why? How do we delight to do God's will? It's because his law is in our heart. The change has happened. God wants to make us a new creature. Now, under the terms of that new covenant, not one soul should be left to struggle helplessly against the powerful urges of the fallen nature. And I love this promise. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. It's interesting. We often say, what is grace? And unmerited favor is a, is a common... I heard a different definition. It was actually from, I think, Webster's Dictionary. It was unmerited assistance. And it adds a little bit more to the picture. If we have sinned, we need salvation, grace will assist us to achieve salvation. But remember, grace is also power to assist us in our life going forward from this moment as well. And that's the promise that God wants to give us. Promises rooted in the changeless nature of God. The other remnant, if we also look in, in Revelation 12, 17, remember the remnant have two qualifications as well. It's the same qualifications as we saw at the end of the three angels' messages. They keep the commandments of God and they have the testimony of Jesus is the wording there. The same principle, the testimony, the, the story that Jesus had, the faith that he had. Those are the two qualifications that make up the remnant. The ultimate remnant are the 144,000. It's a completely separate study, but they're an example to the universe that God is right and just and fair and that his covenant can be them. We're told to strive to be one of them. Seems like a big challenge. But, you know, when God is on our side, nothing is impossible. So, you know, in this world we say, you, know, you can do anything if you choose to. Well, you know what? You can do even more if you choose God on your team. Isn't that powerful? Last text. 
Hebrews 10. And this is, we've just gone full circle back to our scripture reading. Because there's so much in here. And I've titled the sermon, Enter In, because all God says is, I'm going to make a covenant with you. I just want you to enter in. Just jump on board. Be part of this covenant. Hebrews 10, verses 19 to 23 I wish we could read the whole chapter because it gives us so much more context. But having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Now, you and I have no right to any boldness, but we can through Christ. We have the boldness to enter into the holiness because of the blood of Jesus. By a new and a living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. And I love that Paul always puts little bits in brackets. He says, for he is faithful that promised. God is good. God is faithful. Because not only did he die to pay the price to accept our guilt, our blame, but he also rose again. And because he rose again, he came from that tomb, a conqueror. And you know what he says? All power is given in me, in heaven and earth. Go you, therefore. The reason you can go is because he's got all power. In other words, he's offering you a deal that you can use that too. And he says, here's the deal. Here's the covenant. I will make you my chosen people. You just enter into this relationship. That is when we choose to become Christ. You know, sometimes we look at other religions that say, oh, I was born again in a certain moment or something happened. Friends, you do need to have a moment in time when you choose, yes, I'm going to enter into this relationship. You can't just grow up in the church, just come along to church. Sometime you need to say, God, let's do this. Let's be part of this covenant relationship. And I want to challenge all of you, whether you've done that before or whether it is a, a concept that's growing on you, I want to challenge you, make that deal with God you're on the winning side of the deal. God wants you to be one of his children. He says, I've already chosen you. My track record is faultless. I can do anything through you that will glorify God. And that is the key. Can you and I glorify God and show that his covenant deal is something that is a high value to us? He invites us to be conquerors through his victory. Ultimately, he will be glorified through us.